let's kick off this session on OOUT2. So um, thank you for attending. Uh, we'll be covering the um, OOUT2 protocol and the, the working and the internals of the protocol and its design. So uh, my name is Stan van der Ende. I work for an uh, IT company here in Belgium, ACA IT Solutions. We are a, a project company uh, organized in a set of factories um, um, around um, a very high performance software development lifecycle with, of course, an important emphasis on um, security as well. And we develop large enterprise systems that are often um, a SaaS platforms for our customers. And so in that relationship, OOUT makes sense for us as well. Uh, I'm doing this talk together with uh, a colleague of mine. My name is Jan van den Berg. I'm also working for AC IT Solutions. And there, my main job is a senior Java developer, but also security specialist for all our solutions. So here you can find our coordinates in case you have any questions or want to contact us. OK, what were the goals when OOUT was designed? The most important one is delegated authorization. So you as a user, you want to use a certain web application, but that web application needs access, that needs access to data that is stored in another web application. And OOUT makes it possible for that application to get that data on your behalf, but without requiring your password. So it is not, not necessary to enter your credentials in the in another application, um, or how it takes care of that. Another advantage is that you can determine exactly what services can be accessed. So it is not your full account that you give access to, it's a limit of the data that is stored in there. So when we look at a few examples, so when you use LinkedIn, you know that it often bugs you to enter your email address, your Google credentials, to get access to your Google contacts and find connections that way. Um, and that is done by using the OAuth protocol. So when you do that, you have to log in Google as yourself. And then Google will ask you, do you want LinkedIn to, to have access to your contacts? And if you say yes, then that is set up and LinkedIn can access the contacts that way. But LinkedIn doesn't know your password and it can only access your contacts. It cannot access your email or your calendar or anything else. Another example that you often encounter is when you have Facebook and applications are trying to post messages on your behalf. That's also an OAuth login that you first have to do. And there you can deny access to the to post messages or not, depending on what you want. Um, I first want to talk a bit about the OAuth timeline. So, in fact, the first step was taken already eight years ago in 2007. And then there were a couple of companies that started an interest group to find a solution for the problem, how can we access data from someone else without requiring the password. Um, Twitter was part of that, and Twitter has always been behind the OAuth protocol. And a couple of years later, um, it became an internet standard with number 5849, and that is OAuth 1.0. So that was the first version of the protocol. Um, it was not as advanced as OAuth 2, and it was also pretty difficult to use. So a couple of years later, in 2012, there came OAuth 2.0, and that's RFT 6749. And what was added? Um, the use of bearish tokens. So OAuth 1 used mainly cryptographic proof to make certain that you had access to a service. Um, OAU2 uses a bearer token, and a bearer token is simply a string that proves that you can access a service. It has no meaning further on, but it's just randomly generated and given to a third party, and that third party can use it to access a service on a service provider. Another important thing that was added were multiple flows. So while OAU1 was mainly for a web application running on the web server, accessing services from a third party, um, with OAuth 2, it became possible to also support a JavaScript application running in the browser that wants to access those services. And there are also flows to just log in as service provider and also to directly use the username and password of the user. Um, 
finally, I want to give a comparison with, with the SAML protocol. Um, SAML is also often used when you talk about authentication on the internet, but it's completely different from what OAuth tries to accomplish. Um, SAML is mainly about authentication, so there you get assertions, and the assertions tell the third party this person is exactly who he is. He has that credential, that email address, that birth date. See, all things can be in there. Um, SAML tools is also a very a pretty complex protocol. It's XML based, it uses XML digital signatures. Those are not very easy to get started with. But because it uses XML, it's also very strict. It is the messages that you receive, they, you can easily check that they are correct. Um, some of is based on useful trust, so there's one party, the service provider, who says I trust the other party, the identity provider, to, to say who the identities are. And the main advantage of SAML 2 is that there is good interoperability, mainly because of the complex XML. Um, when you have two parties that want to talk with each other, in most cases it just works. Um, while with OAuth 2 it is a bit more difficult. Power 2, on the other hand, is about authorization, so not authentication. Um, protocol is pretty simple, it's just HTTP with a number of parameters that are exchanged and foundation data. Um, the setup is often complex to do because you need to get a client ID and a client secret, and for each service provider, it's a different way of how you can get that. And interoperability is not so good, so each party has its own version of the protocol. Something changed, mainly the response when you engage on an error. Okay, now Stan will talk about the different flows in or out. And in the meantime, I will try to give some good examples for them. So within the or out framework, I must say, because it's not really a protocol hinting um, the suggestion that Jan made that actually interoperability is kind of a pain in OAuth, and it really is because every vendor has its own nifty flavor of that. Nevertheless, in the main use cases, you actually um, you, um, you integrate with a set of big providers, and that set is limited, and they also have a set of APIs in order to access with uh, those uh, services. So the pain is doable, nevertheless, it's a pain. It's not a protocol, it's a framework. And uh, the OUT framework actually um, supports four uh, main flows, and they all serve a specific use case. And I'll walk you through uh, those, uh, those flows uh, more in detail. So the first flow is the server-side web application flow also known as the authorization code flow. The web server, uh, the server-side web application flow is, as the name suggests, a flow where um, there is an intermediary web application, a server-side web application that wants to access a particular resource on behalf of our user. So let's say, for example, that I have a server-side component that needs to access, for example, a photo uh, on a user's Google, Google Plus account. So that's, that's my main use case here. So there is a server component actually sitting um, as an intermediary here. So uh, as depicted in uh, this uh, slide here, there is a user that is using an application. This application has a server uh, component. Um, there is a resource provider. Um, that resource provider is actually providing the resources. And there, at the resource provider side, there is an authorization server that is handling the authorization uh, for access to that particular resource. So that's the, uh, the different components in, in our example here. So my user wants to allow this application access to the resource at the resource provider side. So that's our main use case. So I'll walk you through the flow and uh, the details of that flow. So what happens is actually uh, the user running uh, his browser accesses my uh, application and the application indicates to the user that uh, it requires access to a particular resource at the resource provider side. 
So there is a, a, web, public, a web page in the, uh, in the application that uh, shows information that actually access is required. And the server-side component of that web application will craft uh, a redirect. And that redirect is uh, structured in the following way. So the redirect is a redirect to the authorization server at the resource provider side. Um, it contains a client ID identifying the application. So my server side application is registered in an order flow um, and it gets a client ID and this client ID is passed in. A redirect URI indicating what should happen after successful authorization. The scope, that's actually the, the scope of the access that this application requires. And so for example, uh, accessing a photo on the user's Google, Google Plus account is a scope. Response type is, in this case, code and a state object that's specific to prevent cross-site uh, request forgery uh, attacks. And I'll explain that why that actually is needed later on. So this is a, a well-crafted redirect that the server actually, uh, my, my web application is, is crafting. And my browser will, of course, execute this redirect. So what will happen is um, I get redirected and I get, get redirected in this example to my authorization server because that's the URL um, uh, I'm redirected to. And at the authorization server side, and that's completely uh, separate from OAuth, I need to authenticate, of course. So I authenticate at the authorization server side uh, <clears throat> using whatever, might be username and password, might be um, uh, two-factor authentication in place, et cetera, et cetera. It's completely agnostic. Uh, uh, it has nothing to do with OAuth. Um, and what the um, authorization server will do, it will uh, get the scope parameter in, and it will prompt the user of whether the, uh, this application, identified with the client ID, is authorized to uh, access this particular scope. So do you allow the RCA application to access your photo, uh, uh, for example? <clears throat> there are two outcomes. So let's first go for the, for the, for the bad example. So the user actually denies. And the denial can, of course, have different um, reasons. That can be either because the user is not properly authenticated at the authorization server side. That can be because the user is actually not granting the right scope. So it's actually, he says, I deny access to this particular uh, resource. And there can also be technical reasons. For example, um, the authorization server does not provide this particular server side flow, et cetera, et cetera. So we'll get back um, a, to our callback URL that was specified in the original request to the authorization server. We get information regarding the real error. And this information, that's one of the good things about OAuth. This information is good enough in order to give the uh, user feedback on the reason why something actually failed. So, you see that it contains the error type, indicating why it failed, an error description, more information, and then optionally uh, error URI, indicating the web page where more information on this particular error can be retrieved from. So you have enough context to inform the user of, uh, of the, real, the real problem here. Um, so let me just skip this for now. The good example, to the, to the good use case, um, is, the next, is next. So what will happen is uh, the authorization server now crafts, uh, again, a redirect to my uh, redirect URL of the uh, uh, application server with, as parameter, a code, the authorization code, and again, the state, so the initial state that was passed in when the initial request to the authorization uh, server came in. This code, the authorization code, can now be traded in for um, uh, an access and a refresh token. 
So what happens is the redirect um, will redirect the user's browser again to my application, so my web application, ACR's web application, with this authorization code and state. And the, it's, the, it's important that the, my web application checks whether the state parameter corresponds to the initial state parameter uh, he generated based on, on some information that's residing in the, uh, at the application side. Um, the reason is why that's very important is because without this state parameter, an attacker uh, can pass in its own, his own authorization code. And so um, my account would be linked to the account at the resource server of the attacker. So let, make that, let, let me explain that more in detail. So let's say that uh, I'm accessing... Um, I'm, I'm sending um, using, uh, or, uh, using a REST endpoint, a bank, uh, bank information to my, uh, my resource provider is actually a bank. And I'm sending bank information to my resource provider, right? For an attacker, it would be very interesting to have not my account as a resource owner linked to the, my RCI application, but his uh, account, because then he gets all the information uh, using my application as a proxy, right? So in a, let's say, um, less uh, O-out, um, um, in, a, in, a, in an O-out in world where my uh, application is not a really good O-out citizen and I'm not validating this state, when the user is actually uh, requesting um, access to my, my bank service, huh, the attacker is crafting the same request with an other authorization code. Yeah. And he passes in the authorization code to my application and that authorization code will be used to link his account to my, uh, to my account in this example instead of my own account. So in order to prevent that, it's important that we can actually link this uh, request to link my account with my application to the original request initiated by the user. So the state parameter is very, very important for, uh, for this particular use case. Now, what happens is this authorization code will get uh, traded for um, uh, a token, a set of tokens. So my application server side will uh, send a post to the authorization server. And that post contains the authorization code that it gets passed in, the redirect URI, and the grant type. In this case, authorization code to indicate that I'm trading in an authorization code for an access and a refresh token. When doing this post, the server-side component of my application will authenticate at the resource provider side with his um, uh, client ID and client secret. So when the application gets registered at the resource provider side, with this act of registration, I will receive a client ID and a client secret. And this client secret resides server side at, on my application and is used to authenticate this trading of the authorization code so that the resource provider is certain that he's talking to the application with this particular client ID. That's the idea. So what happens, the uh, authorization server will, of course, validate this request, and it will return uh, an access token and a refresh token. An access token expires, so it's very short-lived. Eh? Normally, it's 3,600 uh, 3, seconds, so that's uh, an hour, but can be shorter depending on the provider. And this access token can then later be used to access the real API at the resource provider side. But it expires. So we also need a way to actually trade in or contact my authorization server for a new access token. And for that, we have the, ref the refresh token. So a refresh token can be actually traded in for a new access token when the original access token actually expires. So what now happens is we have my, I have my access token and I can now do my final call to my resource provider with this um, 
access token as uh, a HTTP header. And so it will be part of my API call to my resource provider. And my resource provider has to actu actually, or the resource endpoint has to validate this access token at, as, at, at his site, validating whether it's valid uh, uh, for that particular request using the authorization server. And if all goes well, I get back my response of this particular API call. So you see that um, there is some, pig, uh, some uh, back and forth going on between the application, the resource provider using the browser as a redirect medium. But once I get my access token, I'm just uh, firing out API calls to my resource provider. Now, the interesting thing, and that's also one of the, the main security properties of this flow, is that the authorization code is the only thing that my browser sees. So the access token and refresh token are exchanged between my application and my resource provider, but never uh, via the browser. So um, it's kind of a server, server trust model that we're here leveraging. So the real access token is never um, sent to my client and can never be um, uh, hijacked there. Only the authorization code is uh, a potential uh, attack surface in this particular uh, example. Now what happens when the authorization code is uh, not valid or the ac access code is not valid? Um, I get of course uh, an error uh, indicating that um, there is a problem with my, my access uh, uh, code. This error depends a bit on uh, the provider. Eh? So for example, um, Facebook will send me a JSON file indicating uh, as a response, uh, a JSON uh, response indicating that there is a problem with my, my access token. And Google uses an array of errors, uh, giving, some, giving, giving a, uh, more information on, on the real source. And that's one of the, the pains of using OAuth, that it's kind of a framework instead of a protocol. This kind of stuff is not really standardized. So you need to uh, adopt uh, adapt your application to, to interpret this kind of information. So that's, that's, that's a pity, actually. Now, when you have this uh, problem, you have this uh, problem with your access code, you can, of course, um, if that's a problem, of course, renew your um, access token when it's expired. And for that, you are using your um, refresh token, something that's stored at the uh, uh, server uh, side and you issue a post to the authorization server with your refresh token, indicating that you have a grant type refresh token, so you want an access token back, and you'll get back as a response a new access token uh, that again expires, and uh, depending on the implementation, a new refresh token that you have to store permanently uh, server side. So, uh, and it's also a good practice to actually expire your refresh token with every uh, access token request as well. Uh, other, otherwise, this becomes a um, uh, very interesting thing to actually uh, base your attack uh, on. <clears throat> so with that said, interesting to know is that uh, from a security perspective that the access token, as I mentioned before, is never sent through the browser. They're short-lived. So that means if you are able to actually capture the access token, that chances are high that, you, that it is expired and that you actually need a refresh token uh, to get a new access token. So that limits the, use of the, the, the usefulness of, of capturing an access token. Um, there is a, a trust between the application and my resource provider because I have, I'm using both the client ID and the secret. And because this is all stored at the application server side, it's something that you can trust, right? It's not something that's public. And when you implement it correctly, it, it inherently prevents uh, cross-site request forgery attack, as I explained uh, before. Uh, it's very important, nevertheless, that the refresh token is something that is longer lived and should be handled with care. Right? It's not something you just store without the right uh, security attrib attributes around it. So that's a very, very important side note, uh, side note here. Um, 
to make it more concrete, I'll pass the word to, uh, to Jan, who will show how to implement this, this mechanism uh, using uh, live coding. So. Okay, so I set up a sample web project. <coughs> it's just a few GSP and HTML files, but they will demonstrate to you how the OAuth protocol works. Um, first thing I have is a, a Maven project, so it's a POM file. It uses the HTTP client component. Um, it also uses common slang and JSON library to parse JSON strings. So the first thing I want to do is I want to set up a page where I will redirect to, to Google to ask for an authorization code. Um, and the first thing I do is I will start building the URL I have to do for that. So still have to come into it. So I create a URI builder and and I start with the URL of, of Google to use it. So code completion doesn't want to work properly. Try to fix that later. Um, when you look at the file with the provider constants, well, it contains a number of constants. The URL I want to, I have to use for Google. It also has a client ID and a client secret, which I already asked him before. Um, so it also has the same for Salesforce and Facebook for later demos. And then, as Stan mentioned, you have to create a, a state, and that state has to be a secure random so that it cannot be guessed. And that state will be passed along to, the, to, to Google, and it will come back when you get your authorization code. It's a GSP file, so oh, yeah. uh, then that, that's what I forgot. <laughs> I was already thinking, why doesn't it code complete? <laughs> okay, so now IntelliJ should be a bit more intelligent about it. That's better. So, well, here I have to specify what can be in the string. So I'll just say, okay, both numbers and letters. It's not really important for the example. What's important is how long it is, and that is certainly secure. Because I need it later, I also put it on the session. So, for instance, variable or out state with a value. And then I add it as a parameter with the name state to the URL. Um, here it is complaining because this can throw an exception, but well, normally it shouldn't. Um, then another thing I have to ask at is the redirect URL. So and I use a util class for it. See which one it is, my own one. It's also very important that the uh, resource servers, at the resource provider side, that the authorization server checks whether the uh, redirect URL it gets back is the same as the one registered when you registered actually the client ID. And you, there was an open redirect uh, problem a couple of years back. It, had, it uh, regained attention a bit wrongly, uh, I think, middle of last year. Uh, because some providers don't even really check the URL. 
So if you don't check the URL at your provider side, you have the open redirect problem where somebody can craft a request to the resource provider with, with whatever URI and it will get uh, the resource provider will redirect the client to that URI. And that's it's, um, it's a security vulnerability. Okay, in the meantime, I've added the redirect URI. So, well, the utility method is just from, it takes the request and it will make sure that this is converted to an absolute URL so that I don't have to do that here. And I also have to add the client ID and it's also in the constant file. So with the Google client ID. Then I have to say it's the server site flow. So we say response type of type of code. That means that I will get back an authorization code. If you use the client side flow, you have to specify that you directly want the, want the access token. Then I also have to specify the scopes I want. And in this example, I will use the profile and the email address. So now I will get back access to the Google profile of the user and to his email address. And the last parameter is also one that's typical for Google and it means that it will always ask for approval. So I have done this before, I've tried it out this morning and otherwise it would just say, okay, he has granted access and won't show it anymore. So this forces that it ask access again. And then I just convert it to a string. Okay, and here I will just add a link to it. Let's see if my server is running. No, just start it again. So with the Maven Jetty plugin to just quickly run the web application. It should be there now. And then I can click here and I just have the login URL. When I click it, I will go to Google. I first have to login in Google. So I believe it's without this. Okay, well, it uses the ACA LS, LSO to log in. So, should also do this only once, so I hope. Okay, apparently I have already accessed the service, so it doesn't show the profile and the email, but it says, well, this application wants to have offline access, and that means that you get a refresh token. When I accept it, I get redirected back to local host, and there you can see the service site web app flow callback GSP. It also has the state, which is a random string. It has an authorization code, which is an other random string generated by Google. And that's about it. So now I will go to the GSP file for that the callback. Um, and here I will add the code to just convert the, to just get the access token back. So Of course, the first thing we have to do is verify that the state is correct. So there is a state that is incoming and it's just a state parameter. We expect another state back, well, hopefully the same, and we can get it from the session. And then if these are different, 
we have to report an error. So um, say bad request, invalid state. Well, I expect things to fail during the demo, but <laughs> so it won't be too bad. Okay, so now we know that the state is correct, so we can go on. And we can use the authorization code to get an access token. So again, we have to make, as a server, we have to make a call. It's not redirected through the browser. And to do that, we built a list of parameters. Um, Just an array list. The first parameter we have to add is basic name value pair is the grant type and it was authorization code. Then a second parameter is our client ID. which we can again ask from, our, from the utility class containing the constants. Then the client secret. It's also stored there. Um, then, the, of course, we need the authorization code itself. So it's parameter code and we parameter with name code. And then we still need the redirect URI again. And it's the URL, URL of this page, so I can just go request URL dot to string. So now we have added these five parameters. Let me see if that's correct. Okay. And then I also have a utility method to send an HTTP post. So normally you can use the, the HTTP client library for that. It's not too difficult, but it's a lot more code to type here. And what does it need? We need, again, a URL. And in this case, it's the Google token URL. And we also need parameters. And the result of that will be a string that contains the JSON data that comes back from the server. And if that's empty, we just ignore it and something went wrong. And I will still also parse it with another utility method. And then we have a map containing the values that come back from the server, and we can already show them. So here I will just say turned values. <coughs> OK, let's try that. So we'll go back to the application. Start the service side flow again. So it asks me the same question. And then it says server error. Something is wrong. Apparently, I forgot something here. And here as well. We we'll just retry this one. So, um, well, the access, the authorization code is in the URL, it was still valid, so I can, can just do a reload of the page and it will then try again. And what we see here, well, that's the value, the contents of the map, so it has the access token, an ID token that is used when you use the OpenID Connect protocol. It says the token type is bare and it expires in just less than one hour. So I forgot to ask it. <laughs> 
So this is that part of the flow. Um, now we discuss the second flow, the, the client side flow where you don't have a server control. Just one remark, Jan, can you do a refresh of that page once more? <clears throat> to see whether Google is a good citizen. So normally it's a good practice when the authorization code is traded in. And there is a next request coming in with the same authorization code that you invalidate everything. That's considered some a hack. So everything will be invalidated. So when, when you actually create an authorization server, make sure you treat um, the authorization codes with extreme caution because they are, of course, an interesting attack surface for a potential hacker there. Yeah, so, but seen server loss, that's the error that came back. From yep. Google, so that request in the code. Uh, Google is a good citizen, so that's, that's nice. Good to know. Um, a second flow is the, is the client-side uh, web application flow. And it's, it's kind of related to the, uh, to the previous one. But this is an example. In this example, we don't have an intermediary. So everything is actually running on the client. And of course, because everything is running on the client, for example, the, the client secret, when registering an application, is not secret. Because it's part of the client, and a client can be decompiled. It can be either an iOS or an Android app or a web application in JavaScript. So there is. The, 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 the client secret is not a secret anymore. So it will not be used in this example. This is also referred to in the specification as the implicit grant flow. So the normal use case is uh, pretty straightforward. I have a rich application, a rich internet application or a iOS native app, for example. And uh, the user wants to use this application to access a resource at the resource provider side. So there is a different um, inter, inter, uh, interchanging of, uh, of requests now going on. So the first thing that the application will need to do um, is instead of um, asking the server side component to create a redirect, it will uh, create um, a request to the authorization server itself. And this request contains the client ID, the redirect URI he wants callback on, of course, still the scope, indicating where the user wants uh, to give access to. In this case, the response type is token. And again, a state, uh, that's something uh, important that to, to handle that as well. So what the authorization server will do is the authorization will once more authenticate the user to validate this incoming request, give the user uh, uh, an indication where he or she is actually uh, granting access uh, to, <coughs> and prompting whether the user wants to allow, of course, to give this particular client ID uh, access to this particular resource. If things go wrong, we have the same redirect um, on our callback URI, indicating uh, what, what went wrong. So again, giving us enough information to uh, give the user feedback on, uh, on the cause of the error. And if things go uh, good, uh, we uh, get a redirect with, in this example, not um, authorization code, but directly an access token. So we're el eliminating the going back and forth between our um, resource provider's authorization server and my server-side component of my application, because I don't have this component in this example. So I will immediately get access to an access token. And this access token will expire in a particular uh, time to live. And uh, of course, there is also the state parameter passed in, or passed back. It's very important to notice that in this example, this is actually passed as a fragment. So it's not a parameter, it's a fragment. Anybody has an indication why it's a fragment? So it survives the redirect. So that? It survives the redirect. It's preserved. Well, it, what do you mean with preserve? Why don't you lose, uh, on, on the redirect, uh, um, you may lose some information. Don't they use the fragment as a way to preserve that? 
Well, the main reason why it's a fragment is it doesn't leak the information to the outside world, right? Because uh, with, with, a, with a request parameter, this can be leaked, for example, in the referrer information. And of course, because it's security sensitive information, it is actually stored as a fragment. Um, nevertheless, um, and that's, that might be a very, very specific de detail, is that it will end up in the history of the browser. So it's also important to actually clear this history away. So that if you then visit a malicious site, and that malicious, malicious site is actually going through your browser history to, to mine for this type of information, that you actually, when you use this information, that you actually clear it away directly from your browser history. But that's, that's it's a detail, but from a security perspective, it's not really a detail. It's quite important. So what will happen is you'll get access to, uh, to the access token. And again, with this access token, you call the API at the resource provider site. So just a plain API call with as the authorization header, my access token. And if all goes well, of if something, uh, well, the next thing that of course should happen is that my resource endpoint should check for valid validity of the uh, access token at the authorization server side. And if that goes good, I get the response back. If that goes bad, I get again uh, a 400 uh, indicating what actually went wrong. Um, in most cases, because in this example, I'm not using a refresh token at all. I'm using the access token. You'll get this error, of course, when the access token expired. So when the TTL, TTL ex, uh, expires, then um, you'll get a, 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 an error indication that you need to go again request uh, an access token and you'll just start from, from the beginning again um, 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 asking the, the authorization server for, for an access token. And because most, um, as Jan explained already, most authorization servers, uh, when the user already gave access uh, to that particular client ID uh, to access that particular resource, it will get, just go uh, through and the user will not be prompted again to grant access explicitly. Uh, so when the access token expired, you will just programmatically request a new one and it will be uh, hidden from the user actually. Because the request will go to the authorization server, the authorization server will see, has this user authenticated? If so, uh, and, the, and that didn't expire, it will go through. It will see whether you're uh, requesting um, uh, an access token with an authorization contact that you already gave access to, and it will just give back an access, an access token again. So the user will not get boggled with saying, yes, I want to give access again uh, to this particular um, client ID to access my resource. Does that make sense? No, no, there is a redirect here uh, going on. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it will just go back to the, in, to the initial loop again. And so you as a client uh, get this uh, response back. You say, okay, I have a problem. My access token is invalid. You'll craft a, um, a URL again, redirect the user to that particular URL at the, at the authorization server uh, site get back the callback and you continue your working internally so it's it's hidden uh, for, uh, for for uh, for uh, for the user in that example uh, he of course sees his browser redirecting uh. <coughs> right so uh, security problems uh, very important is that the Credentials of the user, and that's actually what we want to do with OAuth, is train the user not to enter passwords in whatever, only enter passwords where he trusts entering passwords. So what's interesting to see is that the user credentials are never seen in the browser by the application, but are um, only interchanged when uh, authenticating at the authorization server side. So my, my application never sees the username and password of the user. The access token is again short-lived, so if it's if it leaks, the impact is limited. Is there a way to 
um, yes, there is a way to re there is a way to revoke them. Nevertheless, not all authorization servers um, are good citizens in that example. So normally, uh, it's um, it's it's a good practice when you revoke a token, and mainly you will be revoking refresh tokens because those are the longer lived tokens. That all the access tokens related to that refresh token should also be revoked. Now, not all or out players do that, and they, some of them just revoke the uh, refresh token, but keep the access token as valid. And the reason why they do that is because they're limiting the piggybacking between the resource endpoint and the authorization server. Yeah. So normally when I get an access token in, it's my resource endpoint that should ask the authorization server where this, whether this access token is valid. And for optimization reasons, some endpoints will cache previous results of this uh, inquiry, right? So when a, when a second API call comes in, and it's the same access code, and he knows his access code is valid for a, for a TTL, it, it will never prompt back to the authorization server whether it's valid. So then you ha don't have a central place to revoke your access tokens. But I. So basically, if your access token is leaked, uh, you're screwed. You're screwed, but it has a limited TTL. So you're screwed for a limited time of for a limit, only for a limited time, I must say. But y yes, of course, because it's, 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 it's actually used as a credential here. So if, it, if it's leaked and I have it as an attacker, I can just use it, right? So you have the same problem in your second ID? Yeah, ex exactly the same problem. The only thing is that uh, there is, it's, the protocol allows you to really make the TTL very, very specific and very, very, very narrow. Huh? And because it will only result in more piggybacking, but you're not really bothering the user with that, it's something that's doable. Whether expiring your session sooner is something the user will probably complain about be, because he needs to re-authenticate re uh, every time. So. But it's security sensitive, so you're, you're right. It's, something you don't want to send over using plain HTTP. And by the way, I'm assuming that all my arrows are actually TLS. And so I'm, I'm using encryption on the protocol level. Uh, it's not something you're passing over the wire in, in clear text. There's no support for uh, encrypting or securing the, the parameters in the URL. Everything is sent in, in plain text and, and you uh, trust that the underlying protocol is uh, well. Yes, that's an assumption that was made explicitly when using OAuth. Yep. Yep. So, I do, of course, there is a risk in uh, relying on an underlying protocol. Nevertheless, um, there is also a benefit of that because the TLS infrastructure was deemed at that time as very stable and secure. We know that nowadays there are some questions about that. Nevertheless, I personally, I think it's a good idea and not to reinvent the wheel there, but to piggyback on existing infrastructure that's already in place and, and stable, or that should be stable at least. There are uh, extension um, um, specifications on top of the old piggyback that actually um, use different kind of tokens that use encryption and signing. So there are extensions on top of that, uh, but nevertheless, they all assume that you're exchanging them on a in a secure way. Is yes, um, LinkedIn, no, um, Salesforce is actively using them, yeah. So the, that is the JSON web token uh, approach. So that's kind of a, JWT uh, abbreviated. Um, it's a kind of a XML signature for JSON uh, approach where the JSON data is also uh, signed, digitally signed. And for example, um, Salesforce is, is using that. So when you register your application, you also register your uh, public key uh, where you're signing uh, your request with. 
and it will uh, it will use that to verify the verify the uh, the correctness of uh, of your init initial uh, request coming in. So it is used. Yes. That tiny token you got back. If you uh, decode that, you'll see that that's also a job. Should be a job. I'm not sure whether for for Google you mean. Is it? I don't think so. I think in this application, I can just treat it as a random string. Yeah. Without any meaning. They, they stopped using jobs as a, as a way. Yes, but you have to explicitly specify that, that you actually want or using that, 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 that kind of tokens. That's true. OpenID Connect completely piggybacks on top of the, that uh, specification. Yes. So OpenID Connect actually builds a layer on top of OAuth, um, and it uses the uh, the encryption mechanism um, provided by uh, the web tokens uh, to verify the information coming back from your OpenID provider. So, question. Um, so um, and a side note here is, of course, that because um, there is uh, no way to actually authenticate properly the client in this example, because the client ID is the only thing that you have, and it's in the, in the open, so an attacker can also use the same client ID. Uh, there is no real trust between my application and my, um, my resource provider here in this example. In my previous flow, we have the client ID and the client secret as a way to actually establish this trust. In this example, there is not that kind of trust uh, uh, in, uh, in place here. So from an implementation perspective, Jan? So here we are using just HTML files because it's a JavaScript application. It's running in the browser completely. Um, I will just start with the body, so what I want to do is when someone clicks the link that we just start, we just execute a function to start the OAuth flow. So that's that. And then we have to create a script that will actually implement the function. Um, here again, we need a client ID. And here I have to cheat because I cannot access my constants class. Um, so in fact, I have the full implementation over here, so I can just... already take these. So what do we have here? We have the client ID, we have the URL to authenticate. We have our redirect URL, which is also in this application, and we have the scope we want to ask. Um, we also have to generate a random state. And this is a bit of a problem in JavaScript. Um, here I use the time and I multiply it by math.random, but it's not really that secure. When you can generate a random number at the server side, you can eventually fall back on, on trusted hardware to do it, but when you're in the client, it's a bit more difficult to do that. And then we built the URL, so it's our auth URL, and all the parameters added to it. So I say I have a response type token, so we don't use authorization code anymore, it's directly an access token that we are getting back. We also have the client ID. And just to be proper, we will, of course, encode it. Another one we have is the redirect URI. 
or scope. And finally, the state. And then we create a function that is called when we click the link. And what we do here is we open another window, so a pop-up window, that goes to the URL. Um, it's a new window, and we specify initial width and height for it as well. Um, the reason that we use a separate window is, well, typically you have a, a single page web application, and when you just go to the URL, it will completely unload your single page web application. You will lose all the context that was there. While when you open a pop-up window, then everything that is related to the outflow happens there. And finally, when you come back, you close the window and you can continue in your application. That's the reason that it's done like that. Don't see any errors. So let's try this. So now we take the client side flow. And here it opens the pop-up window, but it doesn't do anything. Okay, thank you. Let's try again. Okay, that's better. So we get the same pop-up dialog, and when I accept it, it will go to the redirect page in the same pop-up window, but we still have to implement that. So how do we tackle that? So well, this is the complete flow. Well, I'll just copy it and explain it. It will be a bit faster. So in fact, as Stan mentioned, we do not get URL parameters anymore, but everything that comes back is behind the hash of the URL. And well, one other reason why that is done is because everything that is after the hash sign, it is not sent to the server. So when we get the HTML page, it will just do a get request for the HTML, and it will not include this. And if it would have been a parameter, then the parameters would also have been sent to the server, and they are not needed there. Um, and what we do then is we take a regular expression, it just, uh, and it will just look for any parameters that are in the hash sign. It will decode them as key value pairs and put them in a map. And then finally, we go to the opener of the pop-up window, which is the window of our original application, and we call a function on it, set all out parameters with the parameters. Um, at that time, our browser will check that this page is loaded from the same domain as the page running there. And only if that is the case, this call will succeed. So for instance, if you try to call a function on a page in a different tab that is not yours, then it will not be allowed by the browser, but in this case it will be. And then finally, we close the pop-up window and we can, because then we can go on in our application. Now I take this again, I said I have to write a function that accepts the OAuth parameters. And it will just do an alert with our access token. So I do the login again, and okay, I had already granted access, so now it's going back and forth and immediately says this is your access token. And maybe you've noticed it, if you looked very carefully, you should have seen a pop-up window popping up and immediately disappearing again when it was closed. So the UX guys don't really like that, for obvious reasons. but. There is another way to actually overcome that is, is with a hidden iframe. That's also a way around it. Nevertheless, yeah, it's a way around it. <laughs> so we have one common implementation with an iframe that just comes in front of the application, but the outflow inflow, and then it's hidden again. <laughs> 
Ja. Okay, back to you. Yes. How are we doing on time? Still have 23 minutes. Okay, that's good. So one of the things that were actually um, that are very important, but but one can consider as an afterthought was actually native application support, because you saw that it was quite redirect intensive. So taking the browser as one of the core assets here, of course, in a native application, we don't have a browser anymore. So there, we need a way around it, right? Um, and um, that's the current um, situation that we're in. We have those native apps, and we need to actually support them. And why do we want to use OAuth to actually um, or in combination with this kind of applications is, of course, to access our APIs, our own APIs, um, because we have a set of REST endpoints that our application uses for its services, or we are using access uh, to other providers that are already leveraging OAuth as a, as a protocol. Um, the good thing about using OAuth for, uh, for this kind of uh, client to server interaction is that if you have a central uh, authentication service, you can actually leverage, leverage this central authentication service. Because OAuth has nothing to do with authentication. Um, it's only actually handling the authorization, but uh, piggybacking on the central authentication service. It's something that you, you, get, you, get, you get as, an, as, a, as a standard in. And so for example, if um, you have a product that, for example, is using SAML, um, for f federated um, authentication, then you're, you're relying to your authentication service for authentication and also piggybacking on the SAML integration that's already established there. So that, that's a, a, a good thing. Of course, a, a very important use case is that you can limit the scope that the user grants this application access to instead of just providing, let's say, the, its complete username and password to the application, indicating, yeah, you can do everything on my behalf. We are now passing in a scope, so the user can actually control what the real application can do. And of course, this can also be revoked. When he revokes the refresh token, it will just uh, revoke the access that was granted before, uh, as opposed to username and password in the application, where the user has to, of course, change the username and password he's using to to uh, revoke access of this application to, to the, uh, the, uh, the underlying endpoint. So that, that's, that's a real motivation to use OAuth in this example as well. So uh, it's very important when you design an application, uh, and I'm, I'm probably uh, preaching to the wrong audience here, but please don't train to your user to enter username and passwords in your application. That's a very, very bad thing. Yeah? Make sure that he only enters um, that he gets trained to only enter username and password in highly trusted sources. Eh? Um, so, for example, when the user can verify the correctness of, of my connection, uh, the validity of my SSL or TLS connection, only then the user should actually enter uh, uh, credentials if you still want to use username and password, of course. But don't let the user enter it in your Android app because he will get used to that, and if an attacker is actually leveraging the same system, there is a, you don't have any, anything to, con to control that anymore. So please don't do it. <laughs> um, of course, um, the question now is, how can we uh, use the, the flows that we already mentioned uh, in combination with native applications? Because we don't have, we don't have a proper browser here, right? So the two flows that we already um, mentioned, the client-side implicit flow and the server-side application flow, can be used with a native uh, application as well. But we need, of course, a way to properly uh, create redirect URIs. And most mobile platforms nowadays actually uh, give you the possibility to register um, a custom URI so that your application can register a custom URI space so that the application, the native application, will get a, re a, a callback back. And with this callback to the native application, he, will, he can 
uh, get the access token or the authorization code uh, on in itself. And it can then uh, go through the flow, as explained before, to actually trade that in for an access token to, to, uh, to, to uh, access the, the endpoint API. So what you actually do is instead of having a, a proper HTTP redirect URI, you actually uh, craft your own URI space that's specific to your application. And with that, you, you get a callback. Now, the problem is, of course, that this redirect URI is not guaranteed to be unique. And that's a big problem. So it's also very uh, almost impossible to solve that from an application platform perspective. But you as an application, you as an application can register your own URL space, but it's um, it's not guaranteed to be unique. So an attacker can can use that as well. Now, how is this actually um, uh, used? Um, well, um, uh, well, let me first explain you a second possibility. And the second possibility is actually uh, the native application flow that has a specific uh, redirect URI uh, with this indicated with this token. And what that actually is, is a standardization of how information should be passed back to the client application. And in this example, in the window title, there is enough information to receive, retrieve the access token. So that's another way uh, around this. So, so instead of registering a custom URI, you as an application specify this as, you, as your redirect URI, and uh, it's interpreted by the, uh, by the by let's say the, the browser, and it will pop up a window, and that window title, title will contain infor enough information to capture uh, the window title and actually use that as a, as a, as a way to, to retrieve your access token. No, the application should explicitly register this. As a, as a, again, it depends on your <laughs> authorization server, but it should. So that if somebody, uh, if an attacker, I mean on the, the mobile. no, no, on the mo it's it's part of the platform support. Yes. yes. Um, now the, the the question is, um, and we. Um, we, for some reason, we still rely on the user to authenticate at, at the authorization server side, right? So we, can, we have the mechanism to actually pass back the redirect information, but the user still needs to authorize uh, this particular application. So for that, we still need uh, uh, HTTP communication in place, right? And for that, we have two possible uh, solutions. I, for me, you only have one possible solution, but UX guys don't like me if I say that. There is the embedded web views approach and there is a native browser approach. So let me explain you that. So I have my, let's say I have a, a native Android application and that I want this native Android application to access my Google Plus account, for example. What this application will do is it will ask me as a user uh, whether I'm okay to grant access uh, to this application to access my Google Plus account. But of course, it, the application will need to authenticate at the Google site, right? So it's, again, bad practice to prompt the user from within the application for username and password. <coughs> so I, I'm creating now in this example, an uh, embedded web view. So I'm creating a, an embedded browser in my application. And in that embedded browser, my user will go to his authentication process. So uh, authenticating at Google and granting me access to actually allow uh, the application to access my Google Plus information. Now, there is a very, uh, is a, from a security perspective, embedded web views are bad in the sense that there is no way for the user to validate the correctness of my security uh, in, uh, exchanges. It's all, it's hidden. There is no Chrome. There is no way that the user can validate whether the TLS connection with Google is a TLS connection with Google. It can be whatever. It can be with an intermediary, et cetera, et cetera, because it's hidden from the user. There is no, there is no Chrome here to actually, um, for the user to validate the integrity of the request. Of course, the good thing is that you can integrate this quite nicely with your native application flow, right? Because it's embedded 
it's, it's, the user doesn't really see another application coming up in the, in the, in the foreground, etc., etc. So from a UX perspective, it's the best way forward. The best way forward from a security perspective is actually to delegate this to the native browser so that the user will see that there is another application coming in the foreground that the user has to authenticate at the native browser side because there he can validate the correctness of the communication. He logs in and then he gets with the same mechanism as mentioned before, we pass in the response information. Um, the good thing is that in most cases probably the user will or might be already be authenticated at the authorization server side so that you don't prompt the user to authenticate again as opposed to the embedded web views that will have their own session store. That session store will probably be empty when you create, when you actually uh, show the user the web view. So the user will probably need to authenticate whether here the chances are that the user is already authenticated in the native browser. But then the drawback is of course that you don't control the session. So there is no way to actually invalidate um, um, the, the cache that the browser has after this uh, uh, um, going back and forth between your native application and the browser. So that's again a drawback of this, uh, of this approach. And then there is a third approach and that's actually completely relying on uh, the native uh, platform support. So that can be either because your platform supports uh, an um, account manager or because you already have um, a native application uh, installed for your resource provider. So for example, you already have Facebook installed as an app on your, uh, on your phone. And then your application can actually uh, ask the app to go through its uh, authorization flow. And so that, that's another way around this problem. But I, to state that clearly, it's kind of clear that OAuth was not really designed with this in mind. It's kind of an afterthought. And we have a workaround that's working, but it's not something to be really proud of. So, so most of these are trace cases where you, you want to hit APIs that are not necessarily under your control. That's a, exactly the use case, yes. So if the API is under your control, what ground type would be the preferred one? So if, if the API is, is under your control, um, See, it's kind of a, it's more or less the same problem as you have here. So you either use OAuth and then you go through this pane or you don't use OAuth. And if you don't use OAuth, you have to train your user or you have to make sure that your user trusts you to provide his credentials in your application. Unfortunately. Is this clear? <coughs> so there are two, still two flows that are actually part of the specification. There is the resource owner password flow, which is actually a kind of a, a, legacy, a legacy flow that su it supports username and passwords. So that's, um, it's a very simple flow. So that's uh, a user that uh, is accessing a resource at the resource provider site and it, it will trade in uh, a username and password uh, for um, an access token. So in this case, um, I'm um, sending in um, my username and password. Um, I'm indicating that my grant type is password, what the scope actually is, and I get back as a, as a response an access token. So in this example, my native application will prompt the user for, to enter his username and password. But the good thing about using this as opposed to storing the username and password on your application is that you don't have to store the username and password on your application because you'll get back an access token and you'll use the access token uh, to actually call the API instead of reusing the username and password that the user entered. So it's not a preferable way to use OAuth, but at least it's, it's it's less evil than storing username and password in the native application. So what I'm now doing is 
the, the user doesn't see the, the authentication service at the resource provider site because I'm passing in my credentials directly. That's what I'm doing here. So that's the real difference. And again, I get back an access token and we do exactly the same piggybacking. So I'm doing an API call based on my access token and not based on the username and password that the user entered previously. That's, that's the, only, the only difference. So with that said, uh, security properties. The user credentials are known to the client application, so that's a drawback, but at least you don't have to store them. And again, we have an access token that has a limited TTL instead of using uh, the username and password that in most cases have an unlimited TTL. So that's, that's the difference. Uh, your username and your password you can change. Yes. You can't revoke your access token. Well, you can revoke your access token. Eh? As I said before, not all providers support it correctly, but your access token will expire. And I'm not sure whether your username and password expires every hour by default. So that's the difference. But I, I agree, eh? it's a thin line, but it's a line. And from a security perspective, this line. Ha if I change my username and my password, it's immediately changed. If I want to revoke my access token, there's a chance that my username and my password still have to wait an hour until uh, it expires. Yes. It was, uh, that's true. But yes, that, that's true. But there is another important thing that your access token is um, limited or is specific for your client ID, right? So that the scope of the access is limited. With username and password, your scope of your access is kind of unlimited, right? So um, it probably will be hard to convince you, but that might be something that can convince you, hopefully. And it also really depends on the implementation of the authorization server. Authorization server could also say, at the moment that you change your username and password, I am simply invalidate all the yes. It doesn't be at the choice of the provider. Yeah, and that's just because we add an extra layer on top of that. <coughs> so implementation, Jan? Um, we're running out of time, but so let's you can find all the code on GitHub, so if you want to take a look at it. Yep. So I'll very briefly cover the last uh, flow that's kind of the credential flow that has a very specific use case where in the credential flow, where actually um, my application wants on its behalf to access the resource provider. So instead of on behalf of the user, it's on behalf of the application in this example. So for example, let's say that um, I have a backend that's the most easy to explain. I have a backend application that's that is actually interacting with a resource server. So I know that my uh, client ID and my client secret are secure. They are not public. So that what I'm doing here is I'm trading in my client ID that's residing at my server and my client secret. Using that information, I'm exchanging that for an access token and this access token will be used for my API calls. This is the, this is the, the, the specific use case that is supported with this uh, application, with this uh, specific flow. So this is the um, client credential flow. Um, so it really uh, requires the client secret to be secret. <laughs> so it's not something to be used for a, for a native application, for example, that you install on your mobile phone, because in that case, you can't really treat the secret as secret. So it's really for more kind of a machine to machine use cases where this, this makes uh, sense as a flow. Let me jump to the conclusions. I think they're next, right? Okay, maybe the short comments yep. first. Yep. OK, so now you've seen all our tools, and so everything may look good or maybe not be good. But in fact, there are a number of short comments in the protocol. And the first one is that it's not a real API. So you always have to interact with the user. You have to do a few browser redirects. You cannot talk directly to the, to the security server and ask for an access token. You have to get the user involved. 
and that makes it difficult to integrate in a, num in a lot of scenarios. So, problem with the native apps is because of that. And also, if you build a web application, well, it's always a pain that you have to go through that. The second advantage is, well, it allows to delegate access from a user to another application, but you cannot delegate to another user. I cannot tell Google, okay, Stan has access to my calendar, he can make appointments in my name, it's not possible with or out. It was also not designed for that, but that comes sometimes back as as a remark, mm -hmm. you cannot do that with it. And also the scopes are often not optimal. So if I as a third party application, I ask for five scopes, the user can either take it or leave it. He cannot say, okay, I want to grant those three scopes and those other two I don't want to, to grant to the application. And that all makes it an all or nothing scenario in that case. Nevertheless, the framework supports it. So it's possible to actually return the scope that the actually the user uh, got. So it's, it has support for that, nevertheless. I don't know any real good implementation in the, in the, in the wild that actually is leveraging that support. So. Of course, if you're building a third party application, it's not easy that you ask five scopes and you only get three and then you have to modify your behavior to take that into account. So, also, if it, were, if it was you, it would make it a lot more difficult as well. And then finally, um, your developers need a strong security background. There are a lot of intric intricacies in the protocol that you have to be aware of. You have to use a state that is a secure random, things like that. You have to make sure that your access token isn't exposed, your access token is stored securely. And your developers need to be aware of that. It's not something that you can give to a junior developer in India and he will use it correctly. So, um, of course, you all know about it now. You're all secure, all, all developers with you know, security. So it's not a problem for you, but it's something to take into account. And then finally, let's jump to our conclusions. Um, I think one thing we can be sure of is for out will be there to stay. So it is there and you have to learn to live with it whether you like it or not. Um, and what you have especially have to look out for, well, inconsistencies between providers, and you have to make sure you understand all the security properties, as we mentioned during our talk. Um, when, we, when, when we went to take a deeper look at the protocol, well, we noticed that it's an interesting trade-off between security and user friendliness. Um, one example is the use of bearer tokens, and there has been a lot of discussion about that. There are people who say it's not secure, you have to use real cryptography, but well, let's face it, what developer really likes to use cryptography, especially for things like that, to, to post a message on Facebook? I don't think you will find many candidates, so, well, it's an interesting trade-off, I can say. <laughs> And then finally, what we did, what I did at the session, well, I coded everything by hand. Um, that's not a good way to do it. It's interesting to make an example, but when you do this in real life, take a look at libraries. Um, the URL mentioned here, the out of that slash two, it has a list of libraries for almost every programming language. Um, I want to mention a few. So for JavaScript, there are a couple of libraries. Um, for Java as well, Objective-C, Node, so you can find anything you want. Um, this is when you implement a client to access a resource that is protected by OAuth. Um, another possibility when you're writing a client is that most service providers have client libraries, for instance Google, Facebook, and you can immediately use that and it will embed the OAuth things inside. So in that case, you don't have to bother with it, you just use the library. Unfortunately, it doesn't work for everything, so for some cases you have to fall back to mm -hmm. go out itself. Um, of course, if you are building your own platform, and you're setting up your own server to support go out, to allow other applications to access it, um, it is best that you also provide some kind of a client library to access your own API. And that it also, if you use OAuth, that you also embed the OAuth with it. In that case, it becomes less difficult to do it correctly. 
And then finally, what can you, what can you do when you build a server? Um, for Java, Spring Security has support for it. So there are, already, there are lots of applications using Spring Security. They can immediately use it. Um, Jersey as well, Apache O2, also mentioned as a client component. Um, infrastructure, we have built uh, a platform on top of OpenAM, and it also already supports for our client nicely. So that's also a possibility if you take your security and put it inside a component in your architecture on your network, then it often already has to pass or go out. Okay, and then finally I want to give some references. Um, the specification, the RFC for OAuth 2 is actually quite readable. So most RFCs are mm -hmm. not readable or only interesting if you can see, but this one is actually pretty good. Um, the threat model and security consideration also an interesting read if you want to know everything about that. Um, you could also read the book by Ryan Boyd, Getting Started with OAuth 2. It also discusses quite nicely everything and all the security implications. And then finally, you can find our credit and the example code online. And this will also be posted on the SecUpDev website so you don't have to write it down right now. Okay, then we thank you for joining our session, and if you have any questions, please ask. So first, thing, you spoke of uh, reporting your refreshments. So how do you do that in practice? Um, in practice, every provider has its own mechanism for that. So for Twitter, there's a page where you can see what are all the grants that I have given, and that are in fact refresh tokens. Google has the same Facebook as well. So it depends on the provider in that case. Thank you.